Oh, Foot Clan, you have been waiting for the truth series, and it is here. We are going to dive into what is the truth about these wide receivers. Was Amari Cooper great for your team or terrible for your team? Will you find out on this episode? Stay tuned. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast, coming to you from pristineauction.com studios with your hosts, Andy Holloway. Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Welcome in, the Fantasy Footballers, back with you, Andy, Mike, and Jason. Oh, it's so good to be back. It's fantastic to be back. Another weekend of... Incredible playoff football in the books. Oh, my goodness. The much-awaited truth episodes are upon us. There's no Pinocchio wide receivers on today's episode. We're going to find out all these lies. <laughs> Their nose grows. I'm just leaving you alone. I was trying to figure out how I that worked together. It just really didn't. I loved it. Big <laughs> swing and a miss like you beat the Ballers team this week. <laughs> Oh, stupid <laughs> Tevin Coleman. <laughs> stupid, stupid Tevin Coleman. They were saving him, man. He took all three of my players out of the game. Because I had Raheem Mostert, which he made irrelevant. Then I had uh, Dalvin Cook, who now it's like, oh, they've got to pass the ball. And then George Kittle, which now you can't pass the ball. I stupid thought the 49ers Tevin defense made Dalvin Cook irrelevant. I don't that, think oh, it was the did. other way around. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. There was there was one bad game. Hey, congratulations over the weekend. everybody playing beattheballers.com cuz uh, you beat me this week <laughs> no matter what you did. That is true. I forgot to put my third guy in. Doesn't still, matter. Still won. <laughs> did you have a lower total score than yes, I did last week? I did. Week? Okay. Oh man, I can't wait. Significant. Saw it was thought it was impossible to do that. They said it couldn't be done. Uh, welcome in. Find us on Twitter at the FF Ballers, Instagram.com slash fantasy footballers. We've got buy or sell on the show today. Uh, distancing myself from whatever Pinocchio reference you were going for, we have the truth episodes for <laughs> wide receivers. We're going to break down uh, essentially the top wide receivers on today's show, how they fared in terms of, you know, actual fantasy finish versus their consistency, how they how they uh, aided or hurt your fantasy football team this past year. Get to the bottom of their actual value versus perceived value. These shows, uh, you might end up listening to them more than once, I would bet, before draft season because remembering which guys you want on your team for next year and the types of things that can happen to players that quote-unquote finish in the top 10 versus what they actually provide for your team, um, it's just important information to keep in mind. Mike, uh, just to give you fair warning in case you want to run out of here uh, kicking and screaming, we will be talking about Amari Cooper. <laughs> why, why would I need to run out? The truth will reveal itself. I guess it sets you free. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my friends, I'm, I'm already in the clouds. I'm free. Yeah. So we have some news we'll break down as well. New coaching hire, some vandalism. We'll get into it soon. <laughs> Buy or Sell, presented by Pristine Auction. All right, Brooks has a buy or sell topic for us today. It's a simple question. Marlon Mack. It's Ooh. a Marlon Mack question. Ooh. Will he finish higher than the running back 20 in 2020? So, oh, this, upcoming, so many 20s. this upcoming season, a buy or sell. Marlon Mack is a top 20 Running back, he finished as the running back 20 in uh, last season with just 14 games played. Uh, we don't know where this team is turning at the quarterback position. Yeah, but for, you know, look, if you're in a dynasty league, a keeper league, sometimes you have to make decisions now. We don't know what the draft is going to hold and, and uh, you know, what free agency is going to do for the Colts. But I'm going to buy it because I believe that the Colts do not want to invest heavily at the running back position financially they have Marlon Mack there is he contract year right and for the so people out there yeah so it, it's a contract year for Marlon Mack I, I I believe that there are numerous ways he can do better than this year one they can get a better quarterback in there which I think they're going to explore try to maybe find 
some uh, veteran free agent who's being you know left alone, a la Ryan Tannehill uh, of 2019, and get someone else in there. Um, and also, he only played 14 games, and he was the running back 20. So I believe that he will be their running back next year in uh, the similar role that he's he's had over the last two. And I, I you, you know, my love for Marlon Mack's talent is well documented. I believe he is good enough to get the job done if the offense can do a little better. And I think they will next year. Yeah, I'll, I'll buy it because it's not a it's not a very high bar for a starting running back to end up inside the top 20 at the position, and Mack is certainly talented. I think you've seen, illustrated by the Kenyon Drake situation change, the necessity of everything to kind of come together. You mentioned a way that it could get better. That sounded like a way for it to get worse as well. Uh, messing with another quarterback, the fact that we saw at times Indianapolis – show inconsistent commitment to you know one running back during parts of games. Right. If you don't have a top-tier offense and you have some committee elements to a backfield, I don't think that Mac ends up in that top 12 unless you give me, you know, unless you can name that quarterback for me right now. But I think top 20 with his talent and what we saw, 14 games like you mentioned, why not? I mean, he finished the year the last two weeks, top 12 back once he was back from – you know, injury or recovering from injury, I, I'm buying it. I'm buying it as well uh, because he'll, I'm projecting him to be the starting running back for the Colts. They're a fine team. They have a great offensive line. Good head coach. Yeah, so he'll he'll be in the top 20. His usage, though, is very interesting because they – it was pretty clear at the beginning of the, of the year they wanted Marlon Mack to be like their guy. You're talking 76% of snaps, 70 61 gets hurt comes back 67 70 percent I mean he's that's a full-time running back if your running back is on the field 70 percent of the time for fantasy football you're very happy but then the end of the year where he was still efficient I mean he was scoring a whole bunch of touchdowns you have what five touchdowns in his last five games he was splitting a lot more with like Naheem Hines but it wasn't it wasn't a predictable split because you have their loss to New Orleans where the, it was 7-34. to 34. I mean, absolutely getting blown out, but Hines not on the field very much. So uh, I think it's a – it's not a situation where everything is clear enough to be able to, like, project Marlon Mack, like, let's go in on Marlon Mack being that top 12 guy like you're talking about, Andy. But top 20 seems fairly reasonable – for a guy, even if he misses a couple games. With the, with that offensive line, he should get top 20. I, I honestly bought first because I thought both of you gentlemen would sell this based on them either bringing in another back or... I'm, I'm with you. I don't think that they will invest in a running back. If, He's if a they, good runner. Yeah. It's just a team that I'm not sure of what the future holds in that division um, and with the quarterback position and the opportunities there. I, you know, He's a really good running back. But, now, if you're saying like, "Hey, dynasty wise, Mike, you think Marlon Mack will be the starting running back for the Colts in 2021?" I don't. I think that they'll find someone else. They'll replace him, and he may go committee somewhere. Sure. All right, that was buy yourself from Pristine Auction. A reminder each week, pristineauction.com. They've mm -hmm. upped. They've upped the bonus. Oh, bonus! This year, if you use the registration code Ballers. At pristineauction.com, you get a $10 credit towards incredible sports memorabilia. You always see it on our walls oh, here in the yes, studio. Oh, yes, you do. You <laughs> see a Mr. Devontae Adams on the wall the, with the alternate colored jersey. He was sensational. Jason, as terrible as your Beat the Ballers team was, mm -hmm. that's how great mine was. Mm -hmm. It almost looks like your signature <laughs> on the jersey, though, Mike. What? No, I would never. It looks a little It actually like, does. <laughs> it does look a lot like your signature. <laughs> so, Mike T. Ray, this just in, signed Devontae that. Adams has a really <laughs> bad signature. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Dude, you just luckily, luckily, there is a... My signature is built for speed and efficiency. There's a JSA authentication yes. that comes with it, so I know it wasn't Mike. Let's get into the news. News and notes from around the league. All right. The 49ers <laughs> popped uh, the Minnesota Vikings bubble in Oof. every way, shape, and form. 27 to 10. That game sucked. Tennessee 
Shocker of all shockers, our reactions to the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, it Look, no credit should be taken away from Tennessee. What they've done has been incredible right. from a coaching execution. Derrick Henry, Ryan Tannehill, everything Tennessee has done deserves praise. But I could not help but feel a little bit like the air was taking out of, you know, th there's just something that felt wrong. Like Baltimore needed to lose twice. Like that's how I feel. Like you need to, you should get to lose twice in the playoffs. After winning. they were so great. Because they were so great. You win 12 straight. Lamar was so good. They're at home. It's just such a shock when you have so much anticipation for a franchise and then it's over. It's done. This season doesn't matter anymore. And the What's hilarious for Tennessee, I mean, this if you jump on Twitter for any length of time, I mean, you you know the debates, teams that are able to run, pass, should you be a pass-heavy team. They have two victories on the road, one against the, the greatest team of all time, the greatest coach, the greatest quarterback, and then against Baltimore, who was the best team in the NFL this year. And Ryan Tannehill has, a, has thrown for 72 yards, and 88 yards. When you, what is happening? What is happening? This is not – stop it, Tennessee. Derek, stop it. Derrick Henry it's just can go into a phone booth and quickly change <laughs> clothes because he is a superhuman. Yes. And, uh, no, it's just – it's been a it's been a really fun ride. It, you know, I've got – 88 in, yards. <laughs> in uh, the playoff challenge, I have uh, A.J. Brown. I mean, you telling me that that the Titans? I had them from Wild Card Weekend. You telling me that you're the getting Titans, that bonus? I'm super into this. The Titans just won back to back games. He's going into the third three times points, but I might get three times zero, <laughs> which anything <laughs> times zero I've learned is zero. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I mean, last year a lot of reliance on Sonny Michel, New England's uh, tr trouncing through the playoffs. First of all, you know. People were posting the Dave Gettleman running team, making fun of him as a general yes, manager. As they should have. Uh, when I saw it, I was like, no, you're right. I mean, the running teams are in the playoffs and succeeding. San Francisco's a running team. They're, they've been that all year long, Kyle Shanahan's offense. But first of all, here, here's an idea. Do both. I mean, you could do both. That's enough. Yes. When yes. You, need, you must do both. When you need to run, Run when you need to pass, pass. That's what Tannehill's been able to do when they've needed to rely on him Never. to win games. <laughs> Not at all in the playoffs. But in the playoffs, no. But but towards the end of the season, he was – I mean, he jumped their, yes. their passing yeah. yards per game up from 200 to 300 something. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, you can do both. Second of all, look, there's no greater validation for a running football strategy than this season's playoffs, at least on the, on the NFC side. Or, I mean, with San Francisco and with Tennessee. Like, to me, it's – it's Derrick Henry is the outlier. Uh, like he's just he he's a beast of a man, and he they have got the perfect offensive line scheme going for him right now. Because it's not all just Derrick Henry getting hit at the line and then grinding out four yards. It's I mean he's he's being he, they're letting him build up ahead of steam, mm -hmm. and they're like I don't care if you think you're the baddest man on the planet. If you saw Derrick Henry running at you with, at, a head of steam. with a head of steam, you're, you're I'm out. <laughs> you're, you're, like, you're going to shout, tell my family I love them. Pretty much. I mean, he's been unbelievable. First player ever, I think, with 180 plus yards in, in three, like three games. games. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, Kansas City came back. Oh, oh man. what yes. in the world with that game? I, I had 51 to 31. Let me just get that in there. Yeah. 82 points scored. <laughs> I mean, in the beginning of that game, when the Chiefs were down twenty-four nothing, I was like, "I wasted, I wasted this the yes. next three hours. Like, there's not going to be a game. This game is over." And whoa, was I wrong? I was so sad. Three for, minutes later, for everyone in the stands, of how Me too. how much did you pay for these tickets? You've been waiting all week, and then it was they should have had to pay triple. The game was bananas, and Green Bay held on to beat Seattle twenty-eight twenty-three. So here we are, and I the like the AFC title game. I like to think that the tide turned when O'Brien didn't go for it on fourth and one. I choose to believe that narrative. Yeah, they, you know, I thought that the kickoff return when he came out of that end zone before he fumbled. I go, what are you doing? <laughs> because you're just you're just multiplying opportunities for mistakes here. Special teams, man. 
it like it was very costly for them, very costly for the Vikings. They were I mean, they at least were holding on to the cliff until the muff punt. All right, so we have Tennessee going to Arrowhead to take on the Chiefs in the AFC title game. We've got Green Bay traveling to San Francisco in the NFC title game. It's going to be fun. It's going to be interesting. Green Bay is still around. No Ravens, no Saints, no Patriots. Oh, man. So uh, we could end up with some very interesting Super Bowls. If I'm you know, rooting for one, it would be pretty fun to see Mahomes and Rodgers. Yes. Uh, yes, but, it but would. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. All right, the Browns have hired Vikings offensive coordinator Kevin Stefanski as their new head coach. Because, of course, they did. They're the Browns. Now, that's like, insulting to like Kevin Stefanski, it, Jason. Look, I don't want to take anything away from He's better than that one game. Sure. No, I'm, this isn't based on how bad the Vikings offense I mean, was. they were really bad. This is solely based on the fact that I think where the Browns made a mistake for the type of organization they are last year is that they went out and they got a guy who, yeah, he's got history, you know, as an assistant or a you know, quarterback's coach or whatever, but he had one year, him being Freddie Kitchens, calling plays as a coordinator, only one year at the coordinator level, no other experience ahead of that, obviously, and they hired him, and it was like he wasn't ready. So they went out and they did the exact same thing. I got a guy with one year of coordinator play calling experience. That you know, that's it. And so, hey, maybe it works, but it's just not the process I would have trusted. I when I put a early twenty twenty fantasy football rankings list together, and I had Nick Chubb in that top ten, top twelve. Right. I got a little nervous about putting him there with what's happening in Cleveland, even though he had been so good this year, I think Stefanski aids the kind of like it, – it better cements the fact that Chubb's going to be a centerpiece there. Unless they upgrade that offensive line to protect Baker Mayfield, this offense is still going to run through Nick Chubb, in my opinion. Stefanski was one of the most run-heavy um, – Offensive right. coordinators in football, which could be a reflection on Mike Zimmer, as it Jason you, Zimmer, you mentioned to me this morning. Uh, yeah, and so that his OC hire it will be very interesting to watch. Yeah, they, they let OC go of hires, Ta yeah. Todd Monken. Yeah, the Broncos hired Pat Shermer. I think it's a great hire. I love this so much. I, I've been a believer of Shermer. I think he's a good – he might not be a great head coach. We've seen that before plenty of times where a guy is a really good offensive coordinator, a good offensive mind, or, or defensive, and they just can't run the whole kit right. and caboodle. Him coming over with Drew Locke and Cortland Sutton, you know, getting Pat Shermer, I absolutely love this. All right, and then Julian Edelman jumped on top of a vehicle <laughs> and was arrested for misdemeanor vandalism now, in Beverly Hills. I need to see the jump, first off, uh, because it's I, – I have experience of uh, – like trying to be fun with with my friends back as a teenager where I tried to do a hood slide on my buddy's car. <laughs> this is just, just turned into a giant hood dent. <laughs> and then, so if you're out there, hood sliding is not as easy as it looks in the movies. It's very easy to just just create a crater in your friend's, <laughs> no, your friend's car. You? Oh, yeah, this thing you was... dented it? Oh. oh, it wasn't a dent. This was a cavern on my... Uh, my friend's hood. So maybe Edelman was just going for a slide and it went wrong. It I don't know. It seems hard to go from that to being arrested. That's like, well, if, know, how but, do you not just take somebody's insurance information and deal with it that way? Well, it, I mean, where where were they? Beverly Hills? Well, I don't think he was doing a, a car slide. He, uh, that's what I said. I need that to see you. the video. I'm guessing How much alcohol was involved? I'm guessing there was probably more than yeah. none. <laughs> <laughs> more than none. Okay. It's time to get into the truth. Before we do that, I want to thank today's sponsor, Simply Safe. Simply Safe Home Security is like getting commercial grade enterprise level security for your own home. Uh, so think about those security, uh, the security that Fortune 500 companies use. That's the kind of security you get with Simply Safe. If there's a break in, they use real video evidence to give police eyewitness accounts of the crime. That means that police dispatch up to 350% faster than for a normal normal burglar alarm. With Simply Safe, you get comprehensive. You laughing at the word burgle? I I was. It's yeah. a funny word. Yeah, it's a pretty funny word. I grilled up some burgles last night <laughs> on the grill, and they were good. Uh, but with Simply Safe, you get comprehensive protection for your home. They've got outdoor cameras, doorbells, smart systems. We've had them here in the studio since way before they were a sponsor of the show. Uh, they've been locking it down for us here at Footballers Headquarters for quite some while, quite a while. 
and it's only 50 cents a day with no contracts. Visit simplysafe.com <laughs> slash footballers. You'll get free shipping and a 60-day risk-free trial. Got nothing to lose. Go now to simplysafe.com slash footballers so they know that our show sent you at simplysafe.com slash footballers. Don't get burgled, people. Don't get burgled. And speaking of things that should be burgled away, the tartar. The get plaque. rid of that. Get, get rid, of, rid of that and get rid of it with the Quip Electric Toothbrush. Look, it's a fantastic invention. They help you create good habits because they're helping you brush twice a day. And they have the, the, the very gentle, very gentle vibrations. And it lets you know that you have been brushing long enough. Because honestly... That's the, that's the bigger problem when it comes to people's dental hygiene. You see some quality time in there. They're just not brushing long enough. People think, oh, well, I went two minutes, and you really went about 20 seconds. Well, I found out today Al Borland's entire family is a Quip family. My but, entire family all the way is a Quip through. family, and it's, I love the brush. It does what I need it to do. And I love the fact that they have a, a subscription where they just send me a new brush head every few months so I get that thing. I, I got to get a new shiny, clean new brush head on the, the recommended schedule from the dental community. Join over 3 million healthy mouths and get Quip today starting at just $25. You can get some free shipping involved. If you go to getquip.com slash footballers right now, get your first refill free. That's your first refill free at getquip.com slash footballers spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash footballers. Quip, the good habits company. All right, let's get into the truth. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Now, I'm going to be the... Uh, let me tell you the truth here. That wasn't the cleanest ad ad read I've ever done. <laughs> so that's, it, was, it was sensational. Well, yeah, and, you know, good partner, Simply Safe. But listen, I, I'm, I started smelling something burning around the studio... Like during the ad read. Right, we mm -hmm. thought we were going down. Well, I, first you guys, I said, I, anybody else smell that? Everybody says, no, I don't smell that. So no. then you tell me I'm stroking out. Well, I, I asked if you were smelling <laughs> toast. You said you were, and that's I didn't supposed know. to be. So a, that's a thing? That's a sign. If you smell burnt really? toast. You're, yeah. you're having a stroke? You, that's, I believe, either that's in the back of my mind. Were so you smelling toast during the Pinocchio joke earlier? Mm, no. Mm, yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's get into the truth. We're starting with the wide receiver position. Today, Thursday, wide receiver truth. They very, sucked. very interesting. Yeah, that that uh, that's that's part of the truth is that wide receivers suck this year. It was very different from last year. Last year you had, uh, what? Well, let me break it down. You had a higher total score for the number one overall receiver this year. Michael Thomas was a beast. Yeah, three hundred yeah. fantasy points last year. The number one overall receiver was Tyree Kill at two eighty four, but the number two wide receiver was Chris Godwin at 233 fantasy points. Whoops. There were he nine total receivers last year that scored more than that. So you had, uh, what, Hill, Hopkins, Adams, Brown, Julio, Michael Thomas, Adam Thielen, Mike Evans, yeah, the and top Juju end, last year. Yeah, the top end scored. advantage was not there this year. You, you just think about the fact that the number two wide receiver this year would have been the number 10 wide receiver yeah. last year, and the top end talent was not there because of touchdowns. Touchdowns did not get all vultured. I mean, and, and really, you know, right. we, we're, we're trying to get the, to the truth here. Last year was a pretty up year for wide receiver uh, touchdowns. So, I, you know, I think you, you take these two years, you look at them uh, together and, and probably the year prior to last year, and you kind of get a good idea going into 2020 for, you know, what the expectation is for a wide receiver. But it, this season, you didn't win based on wide receiver touchdowns. NFL wide receivers caught 287 less total passes. Fewer. Oh, thank you, Mike. You know, look, someone was going to do it. I might as well be that guy. Yeah, I blame uh, – I was reading. That's probably from the, our editor. So it's he terrible. doesn't know how to use I'm, that I'm word. blaming him. 52 fewer <laughs> touchdowns. Ooh, nice save. And 414 fewer fantasy oh, points. Oh, great save. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's a lot. 52 fewer touchdowns. That is a lot. So we're going to start walking through these wide receivers, their fantasy finishes, their consistency score. Jason, do you want to break down a little bit of how we compile consistency data? 
Yeah, so we take a look at great games being those games, and this is all based on half-point scoring. That's kind of the baller's preferred metric. So if you're in a full point, this will be a little less. If you're in a standard, a little more. But a great game for a wide receiver, uh, and we tried to get this about to be the top five uh, type of game on the week, is more than 22 fantasy points. A good game is in that double digits, more than 10 fantasy points. And bus games aren't just under 10. Uh, there's kind of that gap where it's like, meh, it didn't crush you right but uh, you know it certainly wasn't a good game but the bust games are under seven points and so that's like they're outside the top 50 those games crushed you in fantasy those games are are games where when you started a guy you know we people get credit for winning you weeks but they don't get enough credit for outright losing you weeks right and, and sometimes there are players and we'll get into them that lost you a week because they did jack squat yeah and so our consistency score is uh, proprietary, takes a, a look of all of these different percentages and uh, factors in, you know, top 24 per, uh, percentages and all sorts of things to just say, we're going to take a look from the number one wide receiver down uh, as far as we get today and uh, based on how many fantasy points they scored. But then what is their consistency rank? Were they a consistent good wide receiver or were they not and where would they rank based on that uh, score all right so number one overall we mentioned it it's michael thomas he was the number one overall fantasy uh wide receiver he was also number one by way of consistency rank not a surprise he had eight games that qualified as great week winning weeks he had six good weeks he had one actual bust week and so uh, one thing, I don't know if you mentioned it, missed games do not count against your consistency score. So if a player was injured and they missed a few games, we're looking at the games that they played in totality so that you right. understand that when you started them, this is the outcome you received as a fantasy football player. Yeah, because if they were fully injured and did not suit up, you didn't start them. Yeah, they couldn't be inconsistent for you because they weren't out there. But. You have Michael Thomas here. So what are some takeaways from this majestic season? He 149 was, receptions, 1,725 yards, and nine touchdowns. He was really good and consistent and great. Yeah. I mean, he look, we, you know, we talked about uh, the wide receiver two this year would have been the top 10 last year. Uh, that gap, you're talking about he scored 300 fantasy points in half-point <laughs> scoring. The number two was 233 points. That's outlandish that gap so he was the most consistent based on our metric and based on just everyone's experience pretty much every game was good he had two bad games and one of them was week 17 Doesn't when hopefully really count didn't, for him. It didn't even matter so um there's not much to say when you break the nfl record for receptions you have to be consistent yeah michael thomas would have outscored odell beckham jr if we only counted michael thomas's home games this year that's wild man so yeah. Did a so, little bit of that's a little bit of a compliment to Michael Thomas and an insult to Odell Beckham, yeah, that's but why it's great, incredible. What I did not project this, and and I honestly I did not see this coming for Michael Thomas. His jump from four, from 125 and 1400 to nearly 150 and, and over 1700 receiving yards. Yeah, because so, probabilities on the other side of that equation. Right. That's why I didn't like Juju. You didn't think his numbers could go up. It was well, hard to go up for Michael so the, Thomas. So the, the big question for Thomas then, he's the number one wide receiver. He was the number one advantage at the wide receiver position this year. Also the most consistent. Are you just slotting him in to your number one in your rankings heading into 2020? Yeah. I, I am absolutely doing right. it. Assuming that Drew Brees is the quarterback, he should be the number one because his his ability... Well, I mean, with Teddy Bridgewater, he was just fine. He was just fine, but not like number one wide receiver uh, you know, it, what's unique about Thomas is he's completely unstoppable, and it was proven through the duration of the season when he went from the Bridgewater days and being in the you know 13, 17, 22, bring Breeze back. Don't have other weapons outside of Jared Cook, really. I mean, is there anybody that you could rely on outside of Cook? Not really. No. Kamara out of the backfield, and then he goes into an onslaught of top ten performances over the back half of the year. You can't scheme against him so jason's right if consistency of the offense stays the same breeze payton those pieces why wouldn't you just put him at number one yeah it, it would be really hard i mean that's not to guarantee he finishes there but 
when you are both the most consistent and the overall number one, there's no reason you should say, well, I I don't think you, you know his true catch rate this last year at ninety six percent. What is no? So he had one hundred and eighty targets. One hundred and fifty five of those were deemed catchable. So one hundred. <laughs> thank you. One hundred and fifty five catchable targets. He caught 149 of them. I mean, that's impossible. It's amazing. He's making Larry Fitzgerald look like a bad wide <laughs> like right. That guy catches nothing. Drew Brees catches a sticky football or throws a sticky football. Yeah. Uh, Chris Godwin at number two. Let's move on. Chris Godwin came in as uh, – I was – you know, when when you look at the end of the season, I was kind of surprised he, he right. ended up at number two. The gap between saying Michael Thomas's name and what Godwin ended up being seems massive. Jason, he was still the number two most consistent wide receiver as well? Yeah, so spoiler here, the top three guys were also the three most consistent, and that makes, uh, you know, it makes a lot of sense. You would hope as a fantasy player that all the top players, if you just go top to bottom, that top to bottom, they're the same consistency score, and that's, you know, that's mm, kind of true for a lot of players, but that's why this truth series is focusing on which ones are the real outliers who were less consistent than their score or later on who was more consistent than what their fantasy finish was Chris Godwin here you know he did it on a regular basis he he only busted seven percent of his games which is a great number for a wide receiver um he was just very good and I think if anybody out there that had Chris Godwin he was a he was a special get because he wasn't you know Michael Thomas was drafted as a top five, top six wide receiver. Right. Chris Godwin wasn't, and he finished up there. So he was he was just phenomenal. Uh, 36% of the time, he was a weak winning type of player, 64% in the good category. Obviously, he missed uh, week 16 and 17 with injury. Uh, he was pretty impressive. I think he was one of those players people wanted to be behind. In the off season, but yeah. weren't sure with the he was existence the of Mike Evans. He was the hot uh, value breakout type of wide wide receiver, and yeah, I mean, he was very consistent. He did pad like the top end numbers to get up to number two, basically with those two games where he was outrageous in Week Four against the Rams, and then later on against Atlanta. Much better on the road. Much better against good defenses as well. Yeah, it must be just be a, a you know Jameis turned to the easy, the the easier targets. Well, we saw this with the Arian system coming in. This was kind of projected in the sense that the slot wide receiver and Arian right. system it, for a decade has been extremely used. So Chris Godwin going into next year will be you know a top ten draft pick at wide receiver, um, and I think he probably should be. There's a lot of question marks around the quarterback. Right? Is it, yeah. who, Who's the quarterback? Is it Jameis? Is it someone they're going to try to draft or bring in? Or, you know, is it Tom Brady? Oh, I have a new destination oh. for Brady. Of course. Okay, you do. let's hear it. The Colts. What do you mean that's a new one? I've been saying that in the studio forever. Okay, well, it's new for me. When you came in and you said your little weird Titans thing, I was like, dude, the Colts are the team that make the most sense. So the Titans made sense until they got as far as they've got. <laughs> now, now it's going to be, now it's going to be tough sledding. Yeah. You think? We tried to warn you. Uh, Chris Godwin, though, uh, slowed down a little bit in the second half in terms of those yes. impressive performances. Um, and he's like, he's just so fringy with his not bust games. I know, because he's got two that That's, really were. I mean, we, we have to make decisions here. You have to make a, a, an actual, okay, this is the point threshold. Because his two of his three bad games. Where he was wide receiver 42, eight points. Which is above seven. He made it's, it. And then the other one, wide receiver 54, seven points. That's, that's, I mean, he, All right. He's so he, he oh, he's he's towing the line. Points per game from week 10 Dragon on, Ball, for yeah. context, is about where I have Godwin in reality, which is the wide receiver eight. I mean, I think five to eight is a much safer place to put him. I don't think any of us are going to go no. out there and put, are you going to draft Godwin over Julio Jones? Are you going to draft no. Godwin – over DeAndre Hopkins. No. I mean, are you the, the big one. Are you drafting Godwin over Mike Evans? That's a great question. And I won't. I will, and it's based on what this episode is. It's based on I realize that Evans uh, – next year, Evans very, very well might score more fantasy points than Chris Godwin. But the consistency of how those points come I think will be 
more in Chris Godwin's favor because of his role as that slot possession guy. And I, I would rather have the consistency than the big blowups and the busts. And some of that might be team composition decision for your, you know, for the big games right. versus what else you have at the position for your roster. Julio Jones comes in at number three. He was also the third most consistent fantasy wide receiver, as Jason said. The top three guys, they were consistent as well. 33% great games, 53% good games. Uh, one bus game, four in that meh in between category. Right. 99 receptions, 1,394 yards, and six touchdowns on 157 targets. Pretty much the same statistical output at home as on the road. And, uh, you know, Julio being Julio. If we had a consistency metric for seasons, which we don't currently, Julio would be, I mean, he has to be like number one because he just, this is what you get from Julio. We know what we, we you just, you wish, you pray and you hope for more touchdowns. They don't right. come. They don't come. But goodness gracious. I mean, year after year after year, Julio Jones gets it done. The, his listen to these yards over the last few years. This was a real down year. It was. 1,394 he didn't, he yards. He did 1,400. Incredible. Loser. The last several years. He only played that. 15 games, though. <laughs> yes, that's true. 1,600 yards, 1,400 yards, 1,400 yards, 1,800 yards, 1,600 yards. These are – that's outlandish, and, and I don't see it changing. He's under a big money contract going forward. He looked great through the, the completion of the season. So Julio is... Well, the Falcons threw the ball more than any team in football. Number one. So, I mean, it's like when Calvin was out there year after year with Stafford. As long as Matt Ryan and Julio Jones stay connected, is there any reason it's going to change? No. no. And I would I would draft Julio uh, if, you know, over Godwin for sure. Well, And Julio always has the opportunity to be the number one guy as long as he's in that situation. Um. If you drafted him, were you happy with Julio? I think the answer has to be yes. Has it's, to be. Yeah. You drafted him as a top three guy. He finished as a top three guy. Most, it, I say, I say mostly because of when you 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 had a run here, weeks ten or nine through fourteen, and that includes his bye, where he was basically the wide receiver forty seven. I mean, when it was crunch time. Well, that's because he only played in three games. He played, I mean, three of five weeks. You're going to have a bad ranking. I get. Uh, I, I remember it, when though. that time I mean, period was you, there. You can't say, "Well, it's because you didn't play." He hurt well, your team. Then. Independent, you might have been upset, but when you consider it relative to all the other wide receivers and their output, and what we've seen this year with the down year and the fact that look, Julio ended up as consistency ranked number three. Right. It's hard to complain when you look at all the other position or the other players at the position. To me, uh, but there was a period of time when we were kind of like, "Well, you know, after the bye week, where's real Julio?" Catch a touchdown pass, please. All right, number four. Here's where it gets messy. Uh, messy, messy. We got a week 17 patter. That's true. That's true because it was not He doesn't good. feel like the wide receiver no. four on the year. This is why the truth episodes matter. Cooper Cup is the number four overall <laughs> fantasy wide receiver. I feel receiver. like we need to just quadruple check this. This seems so unlikely. The consistency rank for Cooper Cup, 14. Not outside a, the top 12. Yeah, I mean, and you, you felt it, right? Because you look at those first five weeks, he was extremely consistent during that time. And you thought you had the number one wide receiver. I remember a lot of conversation going between Cooper Cup and DeAndre Hopkins. Because right. Hopkins started the year so slow, and Cooper Cup was so good, so far and away the number one wide receiver in fantasy that – it's and, and he had he had been uh, basically that when you looked at his past with the Rams when he was healthy on a per game basis, but from week six on, the dude wrecked your team. If you traded for him after that week five, Oof. you lost. You didn't make the playoffs because you gave up a lot to get him, and then he was basically you know he had two good games the rest of the way. If you're not playing in week 17 that, he was I mean he crushed you yeah wide receiver 33 from weeks 6 through 12 and then and that's only because he had a game where he put up over 200 yards against and, Cincinnati yeah yeah so he also had a massive disparity when it came to playing against top 16 and bottom 16 defenses we're talking about an output of just 9.21 fantasy points against upper echelon defenses 
and an output of 18.74 points against bottom half defenses, something that he happened to play more of in the beginning of the year, distorting his fantasy totals. Will he be drafted as a top 10 wide receiver next year? No, he, I, he shouldn't. I, yeah, I, I don't think you can trust the Rams offense to be what we thought it was coming into this season, what it's been the last several years. Is he a good wide receiver? Absolutely. Will he finish and, and, and be very important for fantasy next year? Yeah, but a top 10 wide receiver is going to be hard for any one of these Rams because, you know, we'll get to Robert Woods probably the next episode, but he was more consistent than Cooper Cup. So, you know, who, who would you want going into next year? Touchdown upside is probably on Cooper Cup, but he really disappeared. And, and you saw some of these problems even in snap counts, where it was like they, they changed up things to All make this All of a sudden, Tyler work. Higby yeah. is uh, focal point of the offense. Thing. Exactly. Now, Cup was one of only, what, three wide or three total pass catchers to reach double digits at the posi- um, in, touchdowns? in terms of touchdowns? Yes, that is true. He had 10. What You know, usually you've, you've got those years, year after year after year, where it's like the number one wide receiver, 14, 15 touchdowns. This year, it was 11, 10, and 10 were the only uh, double-digit touchdown uh, receivers, and one of those was a tight end in Mark Andrews, so yuck. Yeah, and that, well, I mean, normally that is the more difficult to predict number in terms of output, you know, year to year, that's going to fluctuate. He's averaged, Cooper Cup, that is, a touchdown every 9.3 catches over a three-year career. So, you know, maybe a little bit more stable in that department inside the red zone than others. But when you have 10 touchdowns, you end up at consistency rank 14. It's not good. That is a, a warning sign for future draft capital expenditures. And I think we need to remember the, you know, do, do our best – to remember the good bad splits you know the because home road splits good and bad defensive splits those are things i think that uh going into next year a lot of those times those are those are sticky that, that that's the game plan of the offense that's how certain players perform on the home or on the road and remember that going into next year's draft deandre hopkins at number five was actually the fourth most consistent fantasy wide receiver after a very rough start Week one, he was the number five overall, and then he went 57, 41, 52, and the world freaked out, <laughs> panicked. Same thing that they did with Mike Evans, but DeAndre Hopkins, Mike Evans, pretty good players. 104 receptions, 1,165 yards, seven touchdowns, 150 targets. Um, you know, when you look at the season as a whole, Hopkins obviously got it together. He was only great in 27% of his games. That's what I wanted to highlight is the fact that Hopkins was good. Hopkins was was very solid. 67% of his games were good. He was, if he, Once he got out of the, that slump at the beginning of the season where he was busting horrifically, then he was, he was good. But much like the, the conversation of were you happy that you paid up for Julio Jones, were you happy that you – paid up for Hopkins when he was just good. Jay, we're like Yeah, I mean where are you, where are you with Hopkins moving uh, moving forward? Moving forward, he's, you know, a, a top 3 wide receiver still going okay, so he'll still be up there for I, you. Absolutely. I I believe the talent, the quarterback, the offense so, to to like Thomas Julio Hopkins. Yeah, exactly. I think those those are the guys that I'm most interested in going into next year. He, you know, he proved that he is what we thought he was, but when you get off those first four weeks having only one good game and then bad, 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 you feel those because that's the time of year you start the year undefeated, you know? And when, when you're one in three as a fantasy owner, you're blaming Hopkins, you care far less about the consistency that came after that. Yeah, I agree with you. The emotional impact of his slow start and beyond that, through 11 weeks, where you drafted Hopkins – and then you play 11 weeks of fantasy football and you get two top 10 performances from him right. in 11 weeks, it wasn't what you hoped or expected. I would be a little disappointed if I drafted him to be what he was the previous two years, wide receiver two, wide receiver one, end up at five in the end. Um, he might have cost you a little bit this year in that output. But you're moving forward with him that – Yeah, I mean he's two – Drafting year- him more like the – like a top three guy like Jason? I look at it very similarly to the Matt Ryan, Julio Jones connection. As long as Deshaun Watson 
and Hopkins are both there. Hopkins is two years younger than Julio Jones. You should get very, very consistent production from Hopkins. What if there is a shakeup and Bill O'Brien is removed? I remain I remain unconcerned due to just target volume. How could that gotcha. happen? I mean, they want a playoff game. How could game. it happen? They want a playoff game. I can't it imagine. Can de- it, this is the NFL. Players yeah, get, all the, coaches I, get fired in I the playoffs very all the time. Easily, they, they barely won a playoff game, which they were down 16 points at home. And then they blew a twenty-four point lead. Oh, but they had a twenty-four point lead. No, right. I'm just like, I is think... that what Bill O'Brien says in, yes. the, in the room? <laughs> yes, that's one hundred. Says... No, no, no. Look right here. <laughs> we got off to look a right strong here. start. He, I don't think he'll get fired. But for a guy who has been on the hot seat now for what feels like three years, despite having like pretty solid success in the NFL, coaches like that get fired on. when you know. The pieces look like they should win. I mean, Jason right. Garrett didn't make the playoffs. Well, who got, was it? Norv? Yes, in, Norv Turner in, went, for the Chargers. Yes, he was excellent. He was a multi, you know, double digit win Every coach year. year he was double shot, Schottenheimer but, before that, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But the difference is that they had Super Bowl expectations year in year out, and he couldn't get them further in the playoffs. I don't think there were Super Bowl expectations. They're close though. When you when you put uh, Watson. And then Laramie Tunzel, you go spin. Yeah, they to went go all get, in. Now, mind this you, year. he he's their GM too, but so like, that's <laughs> he can't fire himself in that capacity. But um, with you, ha- when you have Hopkins, Watson, Tunzel, you, you you acquire Duke Johnson. Yeah, and then then you I look think they back. They were a Super Bowl or bust. Team. I don't think he's getting fired, but I think Fair. that. But next year, if they regress, which is a possibility, could be out the door. All right, here's where. It starts to get very interesting at the position. Let's get weird. Uh, Kenny Gallo is the number six what? overall what? Wide re- fantasy wide receiver. Kenny Gallo. But it didn't. Kenny G. It, it wasn't as smooth as I think Ooh. it could have been. And A part, few bumps. I blame us. Not us three. but How dare you? But us as fantasy owners. And let me tell you why. Kenny Gallo finished at number six. He was the ninth most consistent, so he wasn't quite as consistent as his fantasy finish, but he still had good games 63% of the time. He had 31% great games, which was more than DeAndre Hopkins. When I say I blame us, I think it's like belief in the fantasy football universe in Kenny Galladay because some of those good games, many of those good games came on the benches of fantasy owners what, like, due to Driscoll. Like when due, David Blau was the QB exactly. and he was playing against Chicago? Yes, but we would never have benched. No matter who the quarterback <laughs> is, you're never benching DeAndre Hopkins or Julio Jones, right? Right. That's but Galladay fair. wasn't in that category in your mind whatsoever. So these good games, this consistency, you didn't benefit from it. You didn't, but what we need to do when we're talking about the truth, the truth is he was the number six wide receiver with terrible quarterback play once Stafford was out and going into next year, that's, you know, we needed this history. You know, the reason we wouldn't bench DeAndre Hopkins or Julio Jones is because we have the history of them being great. We don't have that history with Kenny Galladay until now. Now we know, like, he is a an extremely valuable weapon. He's a great wide receiver. He's got, you know, some of those skills that can't be schemed away, like, height and speed you just can't you can't make him shorter as a defense and so he can go up and get those jump balls around the end zone led the league uh in receiving touchdowns this year uh for wide receivers and uh next year with Stafford coming back I will draft Kenny Galladay for sure as a top 10 wide receiver for next season he did all that on 116 targets which that, was, that's where it's tough yeah. man 116 targets only 65 receptions if this was an old school Vincent Jackson year. It, 65, it was. 11, 90, and 11. Because if, if he catches three fewer touchdowns, if you're looking at 65, 11, 90, and 8, you're not talking about him in this that's top That's a really 10. big difference. But then, you know, to fill in for some of those unpredictable things like touchdowns, getting Matthew Stafford back and not having Blau Driscoll experience is going to help a lot. Driscoll. <laughs> so Kenny, Kenny Galladay this year played uh, eight games – with Stafford, eight games without Stafford, uh, scored four more fantasy points a game, not surprisingly at all, with Stafford. If he gets the whole season with Stafford, I think he's going to be an excellent Possibly, fantasy. Are you yeah. taking him – is he a top ten lock 
locked and loaded for you next year? So the way that I look at it right now is I, I think so. Now, obviously, as we get into the draft season, we're statting these guys out for the UDK. Maybe he drops slightly out of the top 10. I, I do think he's closer to the 10 side, but he's got the talent, and I think he's got the quarterback to – absolutely finish again as a top 10 wide receiver so I assume he will be there for me because you're gonna have to pay you you will have to pay up for Kenny Galladay I'm looking it up last year he was being drafted as wide receiver 19 right at the round like the back of the fourth round he, Kenny Galladay will be what back of the third round so you better be sure uh, of what Here, you're getting here's what I'm sure here's what I'm sure of I'm sure I'm getting a very very good wide receiver who's going to get his opportunities. And I'm fine with that. All right, number seven is Devontae Parker. Yes, yeah. Devontae Parker. Yeah. Number seven in fantasy finish. Number six. Number one in our hearts. Yeah, eventually. No, <laughs> it took a while, Devontae. Number six well, in consistency. Rosen. He had a Rosen problem. Not, well, sure, this year, Mike. I'm talking <laughs> about like the last few years. Well, I'm It not, took a while. not thinking about that. He had a B-hole problem. D that's true. And there wasn't enough preparation H in the world no. to get rid of that problem. No, Adam Gaze is a, <laughs> a vicious yeah. infection. Bring a donut. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's not embarrassing to sit on those at all. <laughs> 72... <laughs> For 12.02 <laughs> and 9 on 128 targets. Do work, Parker. It's not fair that he is the consistency rank 6, which is great. It's not fair because the first three weeks were with Rosen. And if you take those out, he was the consistency rank number 3. You're talking about true elite you know, season here from Devontae Parker. Who's, he was just phenomenal. So he's in a tougher position predictively because well, week, week one was Fitzpatrick that's true just to, to be fair okay yeah. all right that's fair so just kind of illustrating his season he was great 13 percent of the time good 56 percent of the time busted 13 percent uh he was better against bottom 16 pass defenses quite a bit better um 16 fantasy points per game versus 10 I have an update all right sir if you take out weeks two and three leaving in week one He's consistency rank number three. Oh, yeah. So it's still there, still true. But they're, the consistency is what I'm concerned about. Are you going to get Ryan Fitzpatrick back? Are you going to have the target focus that Devontae Parker received after Preston Williams left the lineup? Um, is Miami going to take a step forward? And how do you value Devontae Parker with a rookie quarterback? Um, everything you saw on the field, when you combine the analytics with the eye test and seeing him repeatedly time after time make competitive catches down the field uh second most routes run in the league fifth most deep targets third most air yards all those things are normally indicative of long-term success for a wide receiver uh if you had just put all these numbers out there and made it mike evans i'd believe everything about it do you believe in him moving forward Oof. regardless of the quarterback no, not regardless of the quarterback. I think a rookie quarterback will make a drastic change. Going into the ultimate draft kit, he will certainly have a very high risk rating because of all of the things you mentioned, the quarterback situation. You know, my hope, and a lot of people's hope, um, is that Tua goes here. Because if Tua were to be the drafted quarterback, I would have more confidence because I don't think anybody's looking to rush Tua to the field, um, you know, too early as opposed to, you know, if they get some... Uh, There's only one man that can rush him to the field, and his name is Ryan Fitzpatrick. <laughs> that's that's fair. Um, but you also bring up a really valuable point in Preston Williams and yeah. that injury. I because, pulled up those splits. Yeah, I have them as well, and they're not small. Right, yeah, so you're talking this, a target jump, three full targets of a game, up to nearly any of, like, nearly double-digit targets without Preston Williams, 50 yards a game more. He had 9.7. wasn't there. Now, granted, in this split, you have to factor in Josh Rosen was a part of those Preston Williams games. So it Devontae Parker, man, he's going to be really, really difficult when if his ADP is any anything remotely high, like if he jumps into the fourth round, Fifth round makes it a little bit easier, but he was so great and he finished so high. I you think will his, be able his to, ADP will be up there. See, I don't. I was okay. I, my point was I think if you buy in next year on Devontae Parker, I don't think you're going to have to pay 
Like, I don't think people are going to go draft Devontae Parker next year. You think they're going to take him above a Keenan Allen? You think they're going to take him above a no. Mike no. Evans? No, but he he when people pull up last year's rankings and they see, oh, Devontae Parker, the number seven wide receiver, it, it's he's not going to drop to a place where you're – where the where the risk mitigation goes kind of out the window. Statistically, Parker was very good this year. Yeah. Obviously, very consistent. But the reason that I will be drafting Parker next year is the eyeball test. He was actually good. He would win jump balls that seemed like you couldn't win. His catch radius was all of a sudden very good. He would make some plays where he had enormous separation, and Ryan Fitzpatrick can hit him. Uh, you know, open. So to to me, I think Devontae Parker leveled up. Is he a top ten receiver? Because I think he gets no. drafted outside the top twelve next year. Yeah, I think top he 10 does. to top twelve. I think he gets drafted outside of the top twelve as well. And if that is the case, then I'm in with Parker, because I think the upside is a top five type of performance. It's going to be very difficult. I'm not ready to make a conclusion myself on Devontae Parker. To be it's honest fair. with you, uh, I don't think there's anything to be gained in making that conclusion on him and three, you know, very short window of elite play, unknown quarterback, tough team, tough division. I'm going to wait and get as much info as I can. And hopefully, hopefully Fitzpatrick is back. So we do have some predictability here with Parker. Yeah. If you know, the best case scenario here is that they use their super high. What are they? Are they in the number five? Yeah, they're six. I think. All right. If, well, if they, we've got three guesses. Let's find out <laughs> if they use their high pick, you know, on an offensive lineman or someone other than a quarterback, then you're so much more assured. If they use it on a Justin Herbert or someone that appears to be the future, I don't think you can trust Parker with a rookie. Dolphins at five. Okay, they're at five. Yeah, the the hard part is is even if Fitzpatrick comes back, you know, we have a long history of Fitzpatrick bringing you mid season tumult at the quarterback position, where he's you know he's coming out of the lineup after a few bad losses, and the team wants to see progress, and all of a sudden somebody else is in the lineup, so yeah. you don't have the stability that other. So you're not drafting Mike Evans. Uh, well, no, I, I'm just saying like, that's there's the, a, there's a big difference though. James Winston has been the quarterback for a long time. Yeah, I know, but Win Winston's either back on a new deal or he's franchised and yeah. he should play through it. Uh, Keenan Allen came in at number eight, but he was the 16th most consistent fantasy wide receiver altogether. That makes Keenan Allen's year feel very disappointing. Yeah. I doubt many people out there after week seven or so really, I mean, he just had a really rough stretch from weeks four through nine. He was he busted 19% of the time. He only had 13% great games. That was just two great games on the season where he won you a week. It was just a weird year for Keenan Allen. I don't it doubt was. that he's a great player, but Phillip Rivers. Yeah, that's the problem. Part of the problem. And I don't know if Keenan – I don't know if Keenan's career arc is going to supply me with more top ten years. Yeah, so you know, you tell me you you get twelve hundred yards and eight touchdowns, and I'm I'm thrilled. But the way they came were very boom bust, five, especially with six touchdowns only, five bust games. Yeah, that would <laughs> that would be even less than what you said. That would be that would be less. That's correct. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I mean, mean, if you gave me sure. eight, that'd be better. <laughs> it, it, it's just the the way they came and going forward. You don't even know if Philip Rivers is going to be back. You definitely don't know. No, no, you, no. You don't want it. Media as a whole, that's been a common storyline. I mean, that's why there was such an emotional, uh, you know, press conferences. Are they going to bring Philip Rivers back? I assume he'll be back. But he's not getting younger. He's not getting better. I mean, is is there a world where Philip Rivers just all of a sudden resurrects his career and is is better than he was this season by a significant margin not like age 38? I just, think, I think Mike Williams is a really good player. Uh, he's a downfield threat. I think Hunter Henry is a very good player. I think Austin Eckler's involvement in the passing game as a focal point is a change in the offense from what we've seen before. There was a time when Los Angeles could do nothing but rely on Keenan Allen for every underneath route, for every – Those were great days. I mean, it's just not that way anymore where predictability-wise you can see it. He's number 16 – and that's probably where he ends up, 15, 16, and where I'm ranking him next year. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. you traded Keenan Allen for Hopkins because he kind of did a reverse Hopkins here. 
I would assume that next year Keenan will be drafted higher than where I would like to get him. I'm not comfortable with him being my wide receiver one. No, I agree. I'm would, not. Is either. he? No. Are you comfortable, Mike? I don't think so. And I'm guessing he'll be drafted as a top twelve wide receiver. So I, I stand by my previous. Yeah. Statement. No. I, no. I think you're right. So we'll press pause there. We'll get into more wide oh, receiver man. truth. Some very interesting names. I you lied to you, Mike. Coming next. I lied to you. Get the full Mike Wright versus Amari <laughs> Cooper experience on the next episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Make sure you subscribe. Check out our community at jointhefoot.com if you want a little bonus episode every week with some uh, mailbag questions. And uh, it's a good time over there at Join the Foot. I've heard really good things. Oh, man, I've I'm looking really at good this things. bus number. <laughs> Amari Cooper talk is coming soon. Anything else you guys want to add to the oh, – look at his splits. Oh, <laughs> gosh. Stay, stay tuned for Thursday. Oh, thank you for listening, subscribing, reviewing. We appreciate it. We'll See you be next back. time. Goodbye. Oh, Mike's going to have a field day. <laughs> thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com. And follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. In Foot Clan, remember with Simply Safe, you get comprehensive enterprise level security for your own home. If there's a break in, no oh, burgles. Simply Safe uses real video evidence to give police an eyewitness account of the crime. It costs just 50 cents a day. Visit simplysafe.com slash footballers. You get free shipping and a 60 day risk free trial. You've got nothing to lose. Go now to simplysafe.com slash footballers so that they know that our show sent you. That's simplysafe.com slash footballers.